Welcome to Conversation with Iris, the podcast series on migration, displacement and mobility hosted by the Institute for Research into Superdiversity of the University of Birmingham. My name is Nando Sigona, I'm the director of Iris, and today is a pleasure to have, have a, as our guest, uh, Dr. Angelo Martins Jr. Angelo joined uh, the University of Birmingham in 2022, and uh, his work has been very much focused on the, um, through an ethnographic perspective, on the difference, how the differences of race, gender, and class rooted in colonial history are constantly created and recreated in everyday making of inequalities faced by marginalized and criminalized communities. Hello, Angelo. Hello, hi, Nanda. Hi, well, thanks for inviting me for the conversation. Yeah, I mean, Angelo, this is the only time you will be a guest. From next time, you will be one of us on the other side of the of the screen as well. Yeah, 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 yeah I know. And well, and it, it, it is a pleasure now to be a guest and then yeah. to move to the other side now as a, as I'm also part of Irie. Uh, what I would like to talk to about to you about today is very much uh, around uh, your uh, first monograph, "Moving Difference: Brazilians in London." Your book was published in the middle of the pandemic. I yeah. don't think you had the chance to do many presentation of it because of that circumstances. I'd like to start with um, about the title. Mm. What do you mean by "moving differences"? The title, I mean, I spent a good amount of time tr thinking about this title, actually. And then it came in a conversation with uh, other colleagues when we were like thinking about the, the book. I was explaining them the book. And then we thought, whoa, moving difference is actually uh, a good title because I wanted to emphasize two things with uh, this title, uh, Nando. The first one was to actually emphasize the existing uh, differences among people on the move, right? Which it seems a very obvious thing as we know, but uh, as we also know, every day we are like pretty much bombarded with uh, some, um, let's say homogenizing counts of the migrant, right? Or different types of people on the move. So these categories that, that we create. So emphasizing difference is um, in a way allows us to, to problematize these accounts so whether it is the, the, the pathologizing narratives that we see, you know, um, especially nowadays on the media here or in political discourses where uh, migrants, they are this criminal homogeneous other, right? Um, but also to problematize some academic debates as well that still they tend to reproduce in a way some romanticized and also homogenized accounts of the migrants, right? Or, or people on the move or communities. And, and particularly, and then especially for the book, particularly through debates on the so-called ethnic uh, community, right? In which um, an ethnic solidarity is taken for granted, right? So people would develop uh, bounds of solidarities with each other because they belong to the same national or ethnic group, right? Um, and as, as we know, we just need to spend some time, you know, with any ethnic or national groups, or even like as we have these experiences being migrants here in the UK, and then and then it, we will see that how like class or race, regional differences, they they directly they directly impact the ways in which uh, people build ties of uh, affinities or even exclusion with their co-nationals, right? And uh, so 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 this was very important for me because it came from my own experience as a Brazilian migrant here, right? So when I when I arrived to London, I was I was working with other Brazilians, and then the Brazilians were saying, "No, I don't want to mix up with Brazilians. You know, we are corrupt people. We, we trick each other, etc." So that that's uh, one of the reasons, and and the other reason was also to to emphasize the movement with of the categories of difference itself right so not just that the categories move with people right so and when they when they arrive here you know their class background their racialized identities and so on they will directly um, shape their existence here open up spaces of possibilities or not or how they interact with each other but also the if we're talking about categories they're socially constructed in the movement from one context, political, social, national context to another, the definition of these categories also change, right? So for many Brazilians, for instance, that they, they used to see themselves as white back home, 
when they arrive here, they're no longer racialized as white, right? And this has an impact on them as well. Or even in terms of class, how some markers were very important for them and people would uh, quickly position, position themselves distinguishedly compared to others in Brazil. When we think of, for example, occup occupation, the type of work that you do, you do, right? So then when I arrived here, and then I was doing research also in the past in places of work. So I was I worked as a cleaner, a kitchen porter, waiter. And there were a lot of middle-class Brazilians there performing these jobs in London that they would never have done in Brazil. So, and then they had to, to try to find other uh, markers in order to try to value themselves in comparison to other Brazilians that back home probably would be serving them. And then in London, they were actually their bosses, their managers, uh, for instance. Angelo, this, uh, this, it's very interesting, this point you make about, you know, the how social difference travels with migrants. Uh, but there are two aspects I would like you to, to expand a bit. One is, is does this social difference also travel back? You know, uh, in the sense, is, is in what ways, and basically they become uh, um, the, the, the emigrants, so the Brazilian uh, in London coming back to Brazil come bring back this new status with them or how this interact with the previous one. We'll be interested yeah. to find out from you. And the other one is about, you know, you, you your book focus not just on the present or the social difference, but you really emphasize starting from the very first quote in the book by Tiago mm. about the, the colonial or the historical legacies in this difference. So can you tell us about this, this yes. two aspects? Yes, I'm just writing it down here. So yes. Oh, actually, the travel back is very, very, it's something very interesting and uh, and something that I didn't really develop, you know, when writing the book, but I do think I have enough material to even try and write a, an article at some point because, and it is connected to the second question as well, you know, the colonial histories and so on. So it does travel back, yes, in, in many different ways, right? Even if the person doesn't go back, but it's very interesting to see then, uh, the fact that they are here and because they have moved and obviously depends on their background, but let's say that a middle-class person, right? Uh, a case of a, a white middle-class woman from Rio in the Southeast of Brazil comes to live in London, right? And then when she arrives here because of her documental status, she, she came to, to spend here one year here because of her documental status, because she ended up staying longer or level of her English, etc. many other reasons, she's working as a cleaner or as a waiter. But then um, it's very interesting because there was a situation while, while I was doing ethnography in places of work that this Brazilian guy was taking pictures of us working, right? And then these... Uh, woman, upper middle class woman from Rio, et cetera, she didn't want to be in the picture because she said, oh, I'm dressed as a waitress. I don't want people there back home to see me dressed, dressed up as a waiter because migration for her resulted in a downgrade in terms of occupation and then also class. Mm -hmm. However, in, in, in the U, in Brazil, then the way that her family sees her, it's like, oh, uh, first of all, they don't say, and that's a very interesting, and they, they, my, my, my participants even say that. They, they, they don't say, oh, my daughter is a migrant. No, my daughter lives in London. And also, again, it's not the UK, London. London has a very a strong you know, representation in the imaginations of the, the Brazilians there. So my daughter lives in London. Mm. And then also it's interesting how people play with the words. So if they go back to Brazil and people know that they're working here as a waiter or waitress, they're... They, they don't use like, I'm working as a garçon, which is like waiter or waitress. They will say, I am a waiter. They're gonna use the, the, the English terminology, right? Because this also gives them all their status. It's very interesting. And obviously for those that they have a working class background, it is a massive uh, 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 upgrade as well in terms of status. And then people use social media. It's very interesting because even in the past, like with, before Instagram, like Facebook and so on, you could see how they were using social media to, to, to always try to value themselves here and there in this connection between here and there, right? Because they are living uh, in both places at the same time. And then there is this case of this guy that he was, he, he was a cleaner here and then he paid 
to 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 drive a, a, one of these race cars here in the UK, and then he asked for a friend to go and take pictures of him, and then he paid one thousand pounds, and then back home he said that he was actually working as a as a driver as a pilot. Uh, so so people yeah they negotiate their position so it does travel back and connecting to the second question uh, it is a, it is a, 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 a you know a, 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 a positive thing for them it is a status if you're living here right because of how the past shapes our imaginations and so on so it's it's like very interesting to see for the majority of Brazilians, and it doesn't it doesn't matter class, but coming to the UK and to London particularly, it is shaped by this imagination of I'm going to a modern civilized place, right? So these colonial and post-colonial representations of Brazilians and global south, now that we're using global south or the so-called or former colonial words as body, as instinct as tradition, right? And not as reason, as, as civilization and et cetera. It's two shapes of our imagination. So when people come here, they're also aspiring to consume, to live the so-called modern civilized world. Obviously then what they want to consume here, it's differently shaped by class, for instance, or even like gender and sexuality, but let's like, say like, okay. But Can for I ask you something part, about, the, uh, about this idea yeah. of London as the modernity? Because obviously, uh, Brazil was part of the Portuguese empire. And yeah. so I was wondering to what extent within the, the imaginations of the people you spoke to, you know, what is the position of London, for example, vis-a-vis -vis with Lisbon? Yeah, well, that, that's very interesting. And also because in terms of uh, even like migration studies or uh, post-colonial studies, because usually like now migration studies, when the, the scholarship, when, when they are now taking into account race and the histories of colonialism and so on, they tend to look at connections between empire and colonies, right? That they were actually connected. But the Brazilian case with the UK and London is interesting because, uh, okay, we were uh, a Portuguese colony, but there are some historical things that that make our case a bit different because we were the only colony that also uh, was the capital of the empire for a while because when Napoleon invaded Portugal, the crown moved to Rio, right? So, so that's one thing. And, and, and I can clearly, we can clearly see how this shapes uh, the, the, the imaginations of Brazilians and so on in, in this, in, in, Brazilians want to be an empire, not actually, um, when we became independent and our then uh, the person that ma made us independent was the son of the Portuguese king, right? So there was this disconnection and then we were an empire for us. It was the empire of Brazil. But anyway, but then it's very interesting because in the 19th century, when, when Portugal starts to lose the, the main position in the so-called world system to Britain and to France, the Brazilian elite starts to move away from Portugal and everything coming from Portugal or connected to Portugal was seen as backward, as tradition. So then in one of the chapters of my book, some people even explain, say like, oh, we have violence in Brazil, we have corruption because we have this uh, corrupt culture, tradition culture. We don't have the Anglo-Saxon culture. If we were civilized, these are very common thing. If we had been civilized by Britain, we would be a modern nation. When the Years ago, I was doing research with the Brazilian undocumented migrants, and a couple of stories really struck with me for a long time. One was um, when discussing about um, the risks of being undocumented and the risk of deportation with the, with the Brazilian woman. A yeah. And she pointed out now, and this is linked to what you said before about you know, think social different traveling back and how you are perceived uh, back home also yeah. as an important. And what she was telling me was that she had nothing to fear from being deported because in the end of the day she was deported back to brazil she was going back home but mm. what was really important to her was mm. not to be arrested and mm. this is was partly why the reason she was not considering for example uh, buying a forged passport because if you get a forged passport is a criminal act and you end up in prison first and then being deported yes. uh, and so, so this idea of the shame and the worry about the shame was quite a powerful one Yes. And the other findings from the research, which I found really interesting, was about how significant was a race 
mm -hmm. uh, in, in the experience of the undocumented Brazilians that we engaged with. Mm -hmm. For example, up to the point that some, a black Brazilian was telling me that in London in the weekend, he was never going out. And if he wasn't going out, even for a short distance, he would rather take a taxi rather than public transport because he was, his body was visible in the public space. Yes. While we had stories of white Brazilians that could pass very easily as Europeans, yeah. uh, you know, obviously in a sense they spoke Portuguese and, uh, they, they, and, and they basically had um, a life that was to many extent much less affected by their legal status. Yes. So, uh, so I wanted to ask you, in, with the people you work, work with, how significant was the legal status? The first thing is the legal status is obviously it's important for, for two main reasons. One, we know it's, it's the material impact, right, of, a legal, of the status on people's lives because it will open up or not their spaces of possibilities, right? So, um, so that is like something that we know a lot. But also the symbolic aspect of it it's very important not just because of what many you know um scholars already demonstrated like how you know it is very difficult to to live with with this idea of the portability right the fear of the portability and then uh, it completely shapes your your uh, life and now even like emotionally speaking but but then the shame thing it's a very interesting thing especially like for uh middle class brazilians that they stay here in, 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 in a situation that they're not regular, regularized. So it's very interesting to see how the illegal figure, right, of the migrant is a very classed figure, right? It is constructed in a very classed figure. So then when people are talking about, oh, these illegals, like Brazilians, they're, they're saying like, oh, these people that they come here to trick the system and so on, they are the poor ones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a lot of Brazilians, middle-class Brazilians, they have been through moments in their journeys that they were not regularized or they even used irregular and illicit ways to keep their, you know, their formal and regular situation. Uh, but then as this category, it's a class category and as a consequence, also a moral category, right? That they, it's this stigmatized, representation that they're always dealing with, there is a level of openness. So you have like, for example, in my book, some parts that people say, oh yeah, I, I got married, but I just did because I had to, because they these other Brazilian tricked me and got my money, the lawyer, or yeah, or even there is a passage that this person, is, he is here irregularly. And then he say, no, I think the government is right. The government needs to kick everyone out. You know, and I say, yeah, but you don't have a status as well. I say, oh, yeah, 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 but I'm not tricking the system. I don't come here to trick the system. So this stigmatized image of the so-called illegal migrant, it's something that they are always dialoguing with. So they use different tactics in order to try to value themselves. And one of them is to try to distance themselves from that category. And they will do it according to the resources that they have. So... Then they will say like, oh yeah, I am, I don't have document, but I'm not like Goianos. Goianos, these people, it's people from the state of Goiás who is constructed as the inferior Brazilian here. You know, I'm not like Goianos, I'm not like, so there is a moral aspect here. And this comes with the shame situation, right? So there is, there, there was, I think like I, I, I've interviewed many people that they were deported, but they didn't then tell people in Brazil. And they took another flight. And the, so they, they were like hiding themselves there. And especially in the past, they would throw the passport away and then get a new one and try to come back to Europe somehow because of the shame situation. So it's not really a matter of going back to Brazil, especially for the middle classes. It's like this, this, this moral thing. Because the main thing is uh, the majority of these people, they were seen as the valued body in Brazil. And when they come to London, they, they are faced with this degraded image of the migrant that they need to dialogue and negotiate all the time. Mm. And, and, then, and then just to say about the race thing and connect to the colonial history, that's a very interesting thing because uh, so a lot of the white Brazilians that they are here now, they are also the descendants, the descendants of, of Europeans who went to Brazil in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, supported by the Brazilian state. 
And this was a policy called, uh, well, what we call uh, the white whitening policy or, or the policy of whiteization, because informed by eugenics, uh, the Brazilian elite, political elite, believed that in order to be a modern nation, we needed to make um, our blood whiter. So then we were importing Europeans to Brazil. And then those that are here nowadays, they can either, they could get European citizenship and then, you know, freely navigate here in the UK. And they also would face less discrimina uh, discrimination as you as you saw in, and you mentioned it. And the way that, that and that's, that's very interesting because a lot of people say, yes, I used to, to either take cabs, as you said, or the way that they dress up, right? Because they wanted to show respectability. So again, because if this image of the illegal is a class and also racialized one, so then I need to try to negotiate that and then demonstrating the way that I dress up or show up, you know, how I show up to places, which is connected. And, and also I, I've seen this a lot happening with uh, the African uh, people that I interviewed as well for my other project. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask you about the other the other project you've done. In, in many ways, your your sort of the book, it's you as a Brazilian yourself as a migrant working with Brazilians in London where you were living. Um, and uh, so, what I want to ask you is, uh, how did you find yourself, your positionality? What was the impact of your positionality when then you started to work with other communities? You know, you did work with the uh, uh, Western Africans in Europe, but also Western African in Brazil. So yeah. can you tell us about this this sort of your your position as a researcher, how it changed in your engagement? Yeah, yeah, with yeah. Which is the moving difference as well, right? Shaping then my positionality and my position. Yeah, well, it was very interesting because um, I moved from a situation where I had to negotiate my class, gendered sexuality among my co-nationals, but then it was easier also because to read how these markers could shape my initial interactions with people, to then go into a situation, as you said, that, okay, in Brazil, I am a Brazilian, then researching the other there, mm -hmm. right? And, and then here, I was another, I was a migrant, obviously, with privilege, research, etc. but then researching uh, other migrant groups. So it was interesting because, um, when doing interview with uh, Western Africans in Europe, the fact that I was Brazilian, and, and actually they said that uh, several times, was actually a positive thing in order to build trust and connection with them, especially in the beginning, for them to accept to talk to me. Because when I was like, and actually I'm, and I am an ethnographer, so I spend time with people, you know, and. And then we start sharing our experiences and, and then we, we sometimes work in the same type of jobs or companies. You know, there was this guy that, because I worked uh, cl uh, cleaning football stadiums here and then I'm, I was interviewing some guys that also worked in the same company. So then we can build that thing. But then they said like, look, uh, the fact that you are a migrant, it, it's something that made me also talk to you. So we kind of, it, it facilitated. And I cannot deny that the Brazilianness also was positive because historically, and I think also comes with historical, the historical construction of Brazil, right? Uh, so everyone was talking to, so we, they would talk about football players, right? Brazil, well, football players, you know, so all the image that circulate the world, sometimes in a problematic way, was also positive to engage in conversation with people initially. So samba, music, Football, especially, you know, that, that was uh, something. But then when I go to Brazil, it was different. Because when I get there, the Western Africans, they were already like kind of tired of being, you know, approached by re Brazilian researchers, by Brazilian PhD students. So it was difficult to, to start like connecting with people. So I noticed that and they said, they said that. But then the fact that I am a migrant in the UK, right? Uh, and that many of them have relatives here, or some of them already like lived in, the, in, in Europe at some point, you know, it, 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 was, it was interesting to see like how the migrancy 
aspect of our lives. Uh, also helped to create connections in a way. So obviously there are many challenges when you change these positions. And, and again, these markers, they shape our interactions. But, but then also you need to understand that we are more than social markers, right? And then we can also construct ties in, in common grounds. But yeah, but it was very interesting to see this movement of things and the fact that I am a migrant here in the UK, then in Brazil, worked in a way to, to, to help me to create connections with people. And they said that because they were also always say like, oh, okay, yeah, but why do you want to know why I'm here? Like, like all that thing. Like, and then I was starting to say, no, I don't really want to know why you're here. It's want to talk to you and see what we can think about it, you know, and discuss my project and you see if you want to participate or not. But it was always like, oh, again, you know, but yes, it, it was an interesting yeah. thing. I mean, as an Italian, um, you know, food and, and football are always a great icebreaker, I would say. So I really understand <laughs> um, what you're saying. Um, as an ethnographer, I know that you have used also visual and participatory methods um, and you, you're producing uh, films. Uh, yeah. and, and I was wondering, what's the value of this of these forms of engagement with the people we work with? And what do you get out of it? Yeah. Well, you know, that's something because I, I did my PhD at Goldsmith College, right? And then they have a, a very strong, like, um, well, they, they actually had a, a visual sociology PhD program at the time as well. And all the visual aspects was very strong. And this is when I actually started having my first contact with uh, these discussions. And then through the work of like uh, Nirmo, who was one of my supervisors, uh, Nirmo Poor, Caroline Knows, Les Back, you know, and everyone involved and dis discussing that, like the use of uh, visual and other uh, forms of communication to first collect data, but also then to communicate data was, uh, I think, like, slowly shaping my understanding of research because I come from the Brazilian scholarship is like probably as, as we talk like in Italy and France, which is like like super heavy theoretically speaking, you know. Uh, and then when I when I when I got to Goldsmith and I saw like um an art ex exhibition, you know, an art exhibition where people would they develop like the the research participants develop that exhibition exhibition in part, in partnership with the researchers and then they were there discussing with us and I started seeing the value of that and then now for this project with the Western uh, Africans here uh, and in Brazil as well um, I started discussing with uh, um, Julia Julio Conor Davidson who is the PI in in, in this ERC project like how we could actually develop that and and Julia actually. Uh, she had an idea of doing uh, a, a play first, you know, uh, based on the on the, the theory of the oppressed, right? So then, then the idea was okay. So let's do a play based on our data uh, with sub-Saharan women, actually sub-Saharan African women, and then try to take these to policymakers. And as it was based on the theater of the oppressed. We would then challenge some policymakers and about the decision that that the actors actresses would take, and um, and so then that was already there. So we were going to do that, but then we thought, oh, okay, what about to try to work with movies as well? And then we developed this documentary that we, you recently saw called Voices from Ipswich, in which we said, okay, but let's try to teach this. So we were working with this young. Uh, kids from 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 sub-Saharan African countries living in Ipswich, and then we went there to talk to them about the possibility of doing a documentary and if they were interested. So then we we managed to get this filmmaker um, Sam Libman to teach them how to produce the film, and it was really interesting because we had just an idea about okay, so the film needs to be connected with the project, which is about freedom. And then we were discussing and then the film start, started to happen and they developed their own idea about freedom and what they wanted to talk about their own lives. But I think it was very positive in the sense of, um, first of all, being able to reach uh, things that words cannot express, right? So, you know, the, the art of listening as, as Les Beck would say. <laughs> Uh, it goes beyond of the listening, right? And paying attention to the situations and, and, and things that we cannot really express 
with words and the interview. Uh, so it was very positive in this sense. So, and also how they engaged and they, they were excited to try to show their world, their, their words mm. uh, uh, and their lives to people to try to problematize, especially the idea of how the media portray migrants and asylum seekers. And I think the other positive aspect is how we can then reach people and touch people in a different way, especially outside academia. And I think that the, the moment that we live nowadays, it, it's very crucial to, you know, obviously we know that to get grants nowadays, we need to talk about impact, public engagement, but beyond that, it's also like how we actually challenge what is being said. And, and, and because we know it's very problematic that uh, especially like the way that people are being dehumanized and they are being dehumanized through image, right? Through, yeah. through audio no, I, and I think I think um, to work around concept like freedom is a, extremely interesting because in a sense, it's a concept that travels. You know, it travels, is a global concept, but it's also obviously has got a very different interpretation. There's a different meaning uh, according to your class, your level of education, your age. So it, it, it's something that in a sense has a universal dimension to it and then everyone can relate somehow. So exploring it and give a space for their voice is really uh, you know, extremely important. It also enables you to, to escape a little bit the very constrained uh, space, narrative space that is allowed only within, you know, the very nationalist, you know, the methodological nationalism that often as migration study we apply, you know, we think within the policy space, from within the, the boundaries of the nation, the narrative of the, that, the, you know, Suella Braverman or the Home Office want us to counter with our work yeah. or support in some cases. So it's mm -hmm. really interesting as an experiment, and I think it's, it's really interesting work there. Uh, but just a final question that we'd like to ask you: mm. uh, Where are you, where are you going with your research? What are <laughs> the next direction in this next project? What where are, what do you want to more engage with in terms of uh, your research agenda? Yeah. So actually, at, at the moment, I just applied for a um, few small impact grants in order to continue working. Uh, with this group of uh, young uh, sub-Saharan African boys, actually, uh, here in Ipswich. So we are we are trying actually now to we applied and we got these AHRC small grant to to challenge some of the narratives, uh, the, the global North narratives on modern slavery. So we are going to work with these kids to then produce some. Uh, material visual material that we will, uh, we will actually change the focus on because you know just uh, superficially and quickly speaking the the, the main focus on um modern slavery and and anti-modern anti slavery anti and anti-trafficking uh, uh campaigns they 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 just look at bad people exploiting you know objects and so on and in the transport of it so we want to actually to move the lens to the role of the state in, 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 in producing these situations where people are dependent on others to, to move and to survive and so on, right? And then they are exposed to, to situations that they can be exploited, but they also can be helped. Anyway, so then we are gonna produce that. We actually got the, the, uh, this, this uh, grant, but, I, but my intention is to, to continue now uh, developing this idea of looking at the legacies, especially legacies of colonialism and slavery in shaping the global world, mm. right? And, 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 and obviously using the Brazilian case, because again, uh, because as we know, race has been left out from the migra mainstream migration scholarship for a while, right? But now also when people are uh, using more, it, it's more like looking at empire, especially the UK, like, the continuation of empire and so on, but sometimes also being super influenced by the history of race and racism from the US. Mm. And then they don't take into account how histories of race and racism, they are different according to the context as well. And then when, yeah. as I said, when they move, these concepts also move along there. Yeah, there are multiple genealogies and especially in a early mobile world in many ways, this has become more and more complex. And sometimes there is a risk of the kind of being a reductionist in our interpretation also of how, 
even about the dreams, the aspiration of people and how they respond to a specific form of stereotyping or stigmatization, you know, there is also always many legacies that uh, contribute to how, you know, the positionality of an individual in a specific context, I think is a really important work, particularly Brazil, the, the position of Brazil as a, a country of immigration and emigration with a long history of both emigration and immigration. We have seen the role that is playing now with the refugees from uh, Venezuela, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's such a complex and interesting case study that would be, you know, I think would be a fantastic work to do. Yeah, yeah. So Angelo, th thanks a lot for taking the time for this conversation with Iris and uh, look forward to work with you in the, in the future. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Nando.